Okay, thank you, Sakirati. I think everything is set up now. Vandeham Sri Guru Sri Yuta Padakamalam Sri Guru Vaishnavam Scha Sri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagranaduganatan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakan Tam Scha Magyana Timiranda Sagyanangana Shalakaya Chakshurun militam yena tasmai sri gravena maha. Manchagal patra biascha kripa sindu bevacha patitanam pavani bio vaishnavi bio namuna maha. Namu mahavadanyaya krishna prema pradayati. Krishnaya krishna chaitanya namane gauratishena maha. E krishna karana sindu dina bando jagatpati. Gopesha gopika kanta radha kanta namustuti. Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavani Shari Vrishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priyu Vrindaya Iturasi Deviyai Priyaya Ikeshavasya Krishna Bhakti Prade Devi Satyavatya Inamuna Maha Panchatattvatmakam Krishnam Bhaktarupa Svarupakam Bhaktavatara Bhaktakyam Namami Bhakta Shaktikam Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Pramunityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhara Shivasari Shigaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Hare Rama Eva Kevalam Kalonastyeva Nastyeva Nastyeva Gatiranyatha Welcome, dear devotees, to this week's Sangha class. Welcome, Kali Yuga Bhavana Prabhu. Thank you again for translating. Welcome, Saragrahi. Welcome, Krishna Kumari. Welcome, Sakirati, Shamananda, Govinda Mohini, and Bhakti Rasa. <clears throat> it's nice to see you here, even if I see most of your names only, but Narottam sings in one of his songs, Baishnavira Namiti Ulash. My, my Ulash, my ecstasy is in the names of the Vaishnavas. So I am in ecstasy seeing your names. Today I will continue speaking on the Srimad Bhagavatam. My previous two uh, lectures in this new system of monthly lectures uh, have been on the Bhagavatam. The first one was. Uh, connected with uh, the glories of the Srimad Bhagavatam, why the Srimad Bhagavatam is such a special text, such a unique text that sets it apart from all of the other Vedic literature. The second lecture was on challenges in studying the Srimad Bhagavatam, how we are challenged not only by our own minds, as we are in practically everything we're doing, but how the text in itself poses some challenges for us, some of which are common to other similar texts and some which are unique to the Srimad Bhagavatam. But I tried also to offer some advice on maybe how to overcome those challenges. And above all, I hope that what came through that time was that it's worth to face these challenges. The Srimad Bhagavatam uh, is a jewel, it's a diamond. But diamonds need plenty of pressure to be born, and they are rare. You don't find diamonds here and there on the street. So it's worth to take this extra pressure, it's worth to take this, take this extra challenge for studying the Srimad Bhagavatam. Today, dear devotees, I want to focus on one of the <clears throat> main persons of the Srimad Bhagavatam, and I may continue with this in upcoming classes as well. There's a famous verse stating paradigmatic persons for all of the nine limbs of bhakti that Prahlad Maharaj mentions to his father in the seventh canto. 
ശ്രാവണം കീർത്തനം വിഷ്ണു സ്മരണം അർച്ചനം വന്ദനം ദാസ്യം സഖ്യമാത്മനിവേദനം ഇതിപുങ്ഷർപ്പിത വിഷ്ണു ഭക്തി നവലക്ഷണ ഭക്തി ശ്രാവണം കീർത്തനം സ്മരണം and so on and there's a famous verse that uh, delineates nine persons who uh, are kind of examples of persons attaining perfection through one of these nine processes of bhakti rupa goswami in his bhakti rasamrita sindhu he mentions these nine processes of course the bhagavatam after all is our preeminent scriptural Uh, source our most important pramana or source of brahma or certain knowledge but nevertheless rupa goswami he ends up with a, a list of 64 limbs of bhakti out of which he he places particular emphasis on five in the shrimad bhagavatam we hear about nine and the first of these nine is shravanam shravanam Uh, means hearing listening and shravanam is mentioned first because it's natural to first hear like a, a child who who looks around at the world observes and listens there's a saying in in swedish that even small kettles have ears ears in the meaning of of these kind of things that you listen lift the kettle with so even a little kettle will have ears even small children will have ears they can listen and they can hear all kind of things that uh, people may not think that they will hear they may not understand everything they hear but they will sit there they will listen they will play they will do things but at the same time they will listen to what the adults are saying and we are children like this on the path of bhakti our best chance of advancement is to listen in to hear what the adults are saying to hear what the advanced devotees are saying shravanam listening and listening of course <clears throat> excuse me is a process in itself creating Uh, a situation where we can uh, listen fully because listening can mean so many different things <clears throat> you can uh, listen to a class while playing a game at the same time or doing the dishes or being out running you can listen to the class with one ear and the other ear you can uh, hear a match on tv or you can listen and you can you can chat, scroll on facebook at the same time all of that is listening but of course it's not as effective and not as powerful listening as when we really pay attention so parikshit maharaj he is the paradigmatic example of a listener in the shrimad bhagavata a person who approaches bhakti through shravana and uh, as shravana of course is such an important and uh, central practice for all of us even for me who am sitting here now speaking i also have to listen and i also have to to uh, pay attention as shravana is such an important uh, activity for all of us i thought that it might be interesting for us to get to know the paradigmatic listener parikshit maharaj so in today's class this is what i'm going to do i'm going to uh, take us through the story of parikshit in the shrimad bhagavatam and uh, hopefully we can learn something from his life this may come as a as a surprise because of course he lived thousands of years ago he was the king of the world he was the grandson of the pandavas we might think well that doesn't exactly sound like me 
but uh, let's see maybe there will be something of interest and something of uh, uh, use for us in his story nevertheless and even if there isn't it's just such a great story it's one of my favorite stories in the Shimad Bhagavatam Parikshit Parikshit means the examiner it's not the name he got when he was born when he was born he was given the name Vishnurata. Vishnurata means protected by Vishnu. And the reason for this name is that uh, Uttara, the wife of Abhimanyu, she was pregnant at the time of the Krukshetra war. Abhimanyu is the son of Arjuna. Uh, Uttara was pregnant during the war. During the war, Abhimanyu was killed. If you have studied the Mahabharata or seen the Mahabharata series or something like that, you'll know that uh, Abhimanyu was killed in a very unfair way. Nevertheless, he was killed. And Uttara was left a widow. Uh, but with uh, Abhimanyu's child within her, so that was, of course, something that gave her lots of, of hope for the future. Some kind of happiness within this terrible sorrow of having lost her husband. But Ashvatthama, Drona's son, by the end of the Kurukshetra war, he had seen his father being killed in such a terribly unfair way. If we think of Abhimanyu's death being an unfair death, Drona's death is much worse. Yudhishthira lied that Ashvatthama was dead. And Drona, he lived his whole, whole life for his son. His son was his all in all. So when he heard that his son was dead, Yudhishthira said, Ashvatthama, the war elephant is dead so technically he was not lying but for all intents and purposes he was actually lying and drona knew that yudhishthira never lies so when he heard this he just gave up he just gave up he just sat down and he let the pandavas kill him he was such a powerful warrior that they were not able to kill him they had to resort to such uh, flagrant cheating and lying in order to kill him. So you can imagine what a feeling all of this uh, engendered in Ashwatthama. Uh, so many of his friends, his father, his relatives, his allies, uh, so many of them were killed in the Kurukshetra war and many of them in unfair ways. So by the end of the war, he had this powerful feeling of hate within him if you ever hated somebody you know how powerful that can be and can really feel like a burning fire within you so he decided to to avenge himself by killing uh, the unborn child in the womb of Uttara there were other things going on as well of course uh, he wanted to kill the Pandavas as well and so forth. Anyway, he sent the Brahmastra, this powerful weapon that he only half kind of controlled. He knew how to launch it, but he didn't know how to pull it back. So he was really playing with powers beyond his, his reach. And he sent it to kill the unborn child in Uttara's womb so that the Pandavas, their race would be uh, destroyed their dynasty would be cut off in the Mahabharata the Brahmastra he sends it kills the child in Uttara's womb but Krishna enters the womb and revives the child in the Srimad Bhagavatam which is from a different kalpa the story is told a little bit differently there the unborn child sees this 
terrible flaming power coming towards him. But then Krishna, in the size of a thumb, enters into the womb of Uttara uh, and protects the child from this terrible flaming weapon. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, uh, it is described that uh, even though he was so small, he still had uh, eight arms, uh, conch, disc, sword, bow, all of these uh, weapons of, of Vishnu, a flower garland. Uh, he was blue, he had golden uh, clothes, dazzling like, like lightning. And Vishwanath Chakravarti, he makes the funny point in his commentary that uh, even though he was the size of a thumb, because the unborn child was also so small, he didn't see him as a tiny little person, but he saw him as uh, in proportion as a human size personality. Because Vishwanath Chakravarti says, Afterwards, when he was trying to find the Lord, he didn't look out for thumb-sized persons. He looked out for a normal-sized person. So anyway, he was protected by the Lord. And that is why when he was born, which of course was a greatly joyous occasion for the Pandavas, their grandchild, their only grandchild, uh, was born. He was given the name Vishnu Rata, the one who was protected by Vishnu. But he also got the name Parikshit, the examiner, because he had seen the Lord in the womb before he was born. And somehow that memory stuck to him. Usually we don't remember things from our early childhood. Um, I think I remember something. I, I, I have one memory from kind of kindergarten age or a few not many. Some people say that they can remember when they were baptized or things like that, but that's kind of extraordinary. Usually we don't remember things like that, let alone things that happened when we were still in the womb of our mother. But this experience, it created such a powerful samskara, such a powerful impression in the mind of this unborn child that the memory stayed. Perhaps not in a very vivid way, but in the kind of way that Parikshit, whenever he met somebody in his later life, he would look at that person. Could this be the one who saved me when I was a babe, when I was an unborn child? Uh, he was brought up by his grandparents uh, and his mother, of course, Uttara. Um, but they stayed in this world for some time after the Kurukshetra war. But then when Krishna decided to leave the world, the Pandavas also felt that their time was so up. This is a very important teaching that will come back to us in the story of Parikshit as well. We all have our time in this world. We all have our destiny, our uh, hour of glory, but we also all need to kind of know when to let go and uh, leave room for others. So the Pandavas, they withdrew. They went north on the final journey and they crowned Parikshit, the emperor of the earth. Uh, they they crowned uh, um, ah what's his name Shamananda Krishna's great grandson Vajranabha yes Vajranabha Vajranabha uh, was crowned the king of the Shurasenas in Mathura but otherwise Parikshit was the king of the whole world and uh, he had a very tricky position. He was the king of the whole world at the time of decline. This is the beginning of the Kali Yuga. Uh, a time 
were people from the Mahabharata war, people who had met Krishna, people who had spent time with Krishna were still on this earth. But nevertheless, it's a time of rapid decline. We hear in the Srimad Bhagavatam the symptoms of Kali Yuga in the beginning. Uh, things really kind of going downhill. And Parikshit, in my understanding of him, and here I'm influenced by, by the, the Austrian-born Vaishnava, um, Bimal Krishna Das or, or Walter Eidlitz. Uh, he sees Parikshit as a kind of tragic hero. It's kind of a of, of king who tries with all of his might to kind of stand in the way of time. Parikshit tries to hinder Kali. Parikshit tries to to, to stop the advance of Kali Yuga. And for a little while, he's successful. He, early in his reign, he performs three Ashwamedha Yagyas, the Bhagavatam tells us, on the banks of the Ganga. Uh, and he does something amazing. He travels around his, his country like any good king should. And once he encounters a bull standing on one leg, and he realizes this is dharma, a bull standing on one leg and a crying cow, and he realizes this bull is dharma, now standing only on the leg of truthfulness in Kali Yuga, and the cow is Mother Earth crying. And then there was a a low-born person dressed up like as a, as a king beating the cow, he realizes this is Dharma, this is Mother Earth, and this is Kali, the age of Kali. So he stops the age of Kali. He says, no, you can't mistreat Mother Earth. This is obviously, of course, uh, a story that can be read on many different levels, allegorical. Mother Earth, the age of Kali, Dharma, and so on. Uh, you can't mistreat Mother Earth. You can't be here, Kali. I am the king of the earth. I'm the grandson of the Pandavas. In my kingdom, there will be no Kali. So Kali, he surrenders to him. Before he Parikshit gets to cut off his head, he surrenders. And as a real Kshatriya is not going to kill somebody who has surrendered. But he says, go. I don't want you in my kingdom. I'm not allowing you in my kingdom. I will not allow the age of Kali. And he says, your kingdom is the whole world. Where should I go? Okay, you can go to four different places. We know this story probably. Places of meat eating, places or, or places of, of killing animals, places of gambling, places of of uh, prostitution, and places of uh, which one did I of of uh, uh, intoxication? And again, Kali says, "But there are no such places in your kingdom." You're such a powerful king that you're not allowing any of this to go on. So Parikshit says, very well, wherever there is hoarding of gold, because that will lead to these other four things. So he goes away. Kali takes shelter in these five places. And the Srimad Bhagavatam says, this is the reason for why we should avoid these five things, especially if we're kings. Now, not so many of us are kings, not even uh, Sakyarati. But uh, even if we are not kings, we may be kings of uh, our own family, kings of our own lives, kings of our group, kings of whatever. There will be something where we have some influence. So the more influence we have on others, the more important it is that we uh, avoid these five things. 
So Parikshit, he banishes Kali for a while. Because Kali, of course, is the age of quarrel, the age of uh, war, the age of anger, the age of jealousy and hypocrisy. He banishes all of this. He stands as a stone wall in the face of the age of Kali. And he manages to hold back Kali for a while until he goes hunting. Hunting is one of the favorite pastimes of kings in, the, in ancient India. Uh, they supposedly hunt because that's one way for them to maintain the kshatriya uh, prowess. But really, it's a pastime. It's something they like to do. I've never hunted in my life, so I can't say. But I could imagine that it could be fun if you didn't have compassion for animals. Uh, but lurking there and, and trying to find the animal and shooting it, I'm sure there would be like a lot of, lots of adrenaline and lots of excitement in it. So Kshatriyas in ancient India, they were engaged, uh, they used to go hunting. Uh, not because they needed to, but as a sport, as a pastime. It's not recommended. In the Manu Samhita, for example, it's said that kings shouldn't do it. But you always have the kind of feeling that they're doing it anyway. So instead, try to regulate it a little bit. He goes hunting, and while hunting, he's uh, riding around, maybe running around, he gets thirsty. So he looks around to see if there's anywhere where he could get a glass of water to drink. And he sees the hut of a rishi. These kind of forest rishis are a common element in many stories in the Puranas, or in the epics as well. Uh, sages living in the forest, usually together with their families, but nevertheless having uh, taken up their abode in a peaceful place in the forest. I've just come back from the, the forest, if you will, uh, myself from our Sri Chaitanya Dham in the, out on an island here in, in Finland today. And uh, coming into this little city of, of, of Turku or Obu here, here does feel like coming coming uh, uh, out of the forest in a way. It's nice. It's also a little bit scary. So many rishis, they would go to the forest. They would go to beautiful, remote places to engage in their bhajan. So he meets one of these rishis, Shamika Rishi. And he's sitting there meditating. Parikshit goes up to him and, and, and says, Namaste, uh, can I please have a glass of water? And the Rishi says nothing. Because he really is uh, engrossed in meditation. Parikshit gets upset. He gets irritated. Uh, if you ask my wife, you'll know that. Uh, I'm a person who can also get irritated when I'm thirsty or when I'm hungry, grumpy. So this is what happens to Parikshit. He gets irritated with this Rishi. How can he be so lazy? He's just sitting there. Okay, maybe he was meditating, but I know nobody meditates so deeply that when somebody comes and asks them for a glass of water, they can't get up and give that. So he sees the dead snake. We know the story on the ground nearby. He lifts up the snake, not with his hand, but with the, the edge of his bow. And he puts the snake as a garland on the rishi and goes away in a fit of anger. Now, Parikshit was born as the grandson of the Pandavas. He has been exemplary his whole life so far. 
Uh, he's he's a, a a householder. He's married. He has four children. Uh, but he's a very moderate person in every way. He has one wife, which for a king is is kind of not very much. He has been able to keep back the age of Kali. And now he becomes so angry with some poor Rishi that he puts a snake around his neck. How is this possible? Vishwana Chakravarti Thakur, he says that there's two things we can learn from this particular incident. One is that when Vaishnavas uh, perform sin accidentally, accidentally in the sense that it's not premeditated, uh, that sin will have some uh, effect on their life, but the effect will be for their good. Uh, so let's say that I would uh, do something stupid. I would get some kind of punishment for that, but that punishment would lead me to a deeper state of Krishna consciousness. Again, accidentally means without premeditation, not that you're kind of thinking, hmm, what if I would do this? Maybe it would lead to something good and in the end... If I would have an affair with that person. No, not anything like that. But the thing which happens like it happened here to Parikshit, just out of uh, what it's, it seems like it's like out of chance, he gets so upset with this Rishi, he garlands him with a snake. So that's one side. He... Uh, Vishnu Chakravarti says, accidental sins or devotees lead to uh, something good for them in the end. And we'll hear what that is, of course, in a little while. Uh, the other thing is, Vishnu Chakravarti says, later passages in the Srimad Bhagavatam will show us that. Everything that happens here is according to Krishna's will. Krishna wanted this to happen. Why? Because he wanted the company of Parikshit. He wanted Parikshit to come to him. Back to Godhead, to use Prabhupada's term. Um, I remember as a young man hearing hearing about somebody who had died, some child or something. And uh, he, uh, a young child had died. And it was explained then the death of that child that God couldn't bear separation from this child. So that's why God took this child back to him early. And... Uh, People can take a statement like that in different ways. When I heard it, I thought that that's kind of a nice thing to say. Sounds, sounds, sounds kind of beautiful. So I was surprised when I saw Vishwanath Chakravarti say exactly the same thing in the Srimad Bhagavatam, in his commentary to the Srimad Bhagavatam, that Krishna couldn't bear separation from Parikshit anymore. He wanted him to come back to Godhead. Not literally back, of course, but to come to him. So he arranges for this. It's a leela, it's a pastime. Krishna arranges for Parikshit's understanding to be clouded over by anger. He arranges for him to become so thirsty and irritated. And what's the best proof of this being a leela? The very fact that Parikshit goes back from uh, that Rishi's hermitage. And immediately after getting back, on the way he hears the news of everything that has happened, immediately he goes and sits down on the banks of the Ganges to fast until death. 
So he's so thirsty that he gets upset with the Rishi, but he never drinks afterwards. There's no mention in the Srimad Bhagavatam of Parikshit ever drinking. So he's, this, his irritation caused by his thirst, it must have been something that Krishna just uh, created on the spur of moment to uh, make Parikshit's journey back to Godhead quicker. So, of course, uh, the Rishi's son, Shringi, he sees what has happened and uh, uh, mostly kind of to impress his friends, he curses the king. That just see, the kings now in Kali Yuga, uh, they're supposed to be the gatekeepers of the Brahmanas, but look what this puffed up impudent king has done. He has insulted my father in this way, my innocent father. So he curses the king to die in seven days. Parikshit hears this already on the way back. And he immediately accepts the curse. Again in the Mahabharata, there's a different story of Parikshit, different Parikshit. But the Parikshit in the Srimad Bhagavatam, he accepts the curse immediately. He doesn't think of how to counteract it. He doesn't think of how he can uh, maybe get the, the boy to retract the curse, or maybe he can uh, curse the boy back. But if I kill the boy before the seventh day has ended, then maybe the curse will die with him. Or so. He doesn't think about anything like that. He just accepts it. So he gives up his whole uh, uh, kingdom, his family, his wife, his sons. He goes to the banks of the Ganges. Dio Swami says it's actually the banks of the Yamuna. But I think the Bhagavatam is fairly clear on saying it's, it's the Ganges. Uh, and there he sits down to fast until his death. And around him, a whole group of people gather. Kripa, uh, uh, Dhaumya, others of these ancient rishis, still from the time of the Pandavas, uh, experts in the different schools of Vedic philosophy, everybody very eager in uh, guiding the king in his last days. And of course, Parikshit has a question. I'm sitting here now, waiting for my death in seven days. What should I do now? And they're all full of advice. Now you should engage in yoga. You should start with some asana practice. Then we will teach you pranayama. Some others say, no, 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 no. This is not necessary. But it's necessary that you now become fully acquainted with uh, the rules of logic so that you can fix your mind on whatever is ultimately true. So you have to learn about the different categories. You have to learn about how to differentiate between different levels of reality. Others say, no, not so necessary. But it is very necessary to understand this world, to understand the different padarthas, the different categories of this world. This is the philosophy of Vaisheshika. Uh, and so on and so forth. So many different opinions. And they are not really quarreling, but they're all kind of speaking in each other's mouths. This is how I'm env envisioning it. And then suddenly, there's this commotion. All the rishis are sitting there, and suddenly there's this commotion. You hear laughing Somewhere in the side, some women are laughing and such children are screaming. There's this group of people milling about. And then from that group comes a boy, a young boy of 16. Dark, with long hair, naked. 
And all these women and children, they are making fun of this naked, seemingly crazy person. He has long kind of unkempt hair. Uh, but when all the rishis see this boy, they all stand up. Yam pravrajanta manupeta mapeta krityam dvaipaya ino virahakatara ajaha. This is the son of Vyasadeva. This is Shuka, who remained in his mother's womb for 16 years, not as to get entangled in material life. And then when he was born, he immediately left for the forest. Immediately he went. And he was only uh, convinced to go back through hearing the verses of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Then he heard all of the Srimad Bhagavatam from Yasa. And since then, he's been wandering the world, seemingly like a crazy person. These women and children thought he was some madman. But all the rishis, they know, this is no madman. This is a person who's keeping his spirituality hidden. This is a particular kind of saint who hides her or his spirituality. We have many examples of this in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Shuka, Shuka Deva, Divine Shuka, is uh, the most important of all these examples. So he's hidden his spirituality. He's never said a word. word. He's silent. But the rishis, when they see him, they all stand up. and They all offer him pride of place. Sit down here, sir. And he sits down there, Parikshit, addresses his question to him. What should a man do who is about to die in seven days? And then Shukadev, who has been silent for all this time, starts speaking. And this is the beginning then of the second canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And the rest of the Srimad Bhagavatam uh, is a discussion then between Shukadeva and Parikshit. Uh, for seven days, they sit there on the banks of the Ganges, speaking and listening. Shuka being the speaker. Shukadeva, of course, is the paradigmatic example of Kirtana, glorifying the Lord. Parikshit, the example of Shravana, listening. So what kind of listening does he engage in? Firstly, he listens very carefully. This we can see again and again in Shrimad Bhagavatam. He listens very carefully in the sense that uh, uh, oftentimes Shuka will say something kind of surprising just shortly in a verse. He will say something like, uh, and then they all uh, lived happily, until the child died. But he listens very carefully, Parikshit. So whenever Shukadev is dropping like these small bombs, he always picks them up and he asks, Oh great Shukadeva, Oh son of Yasadeva, if you think that this is something that will further illuminate the glories of the Supreme Lord Krishna, tell us about that son who died, for example. So he's not only a, a kind of mindless uh, body with two holes that just listens. He listens in a very active way. He pays attention and he asks questions. Shravana, listening, means paying attention, but it also means uh, uh, being active. Whenever there's something that uh, Shukadev says that Parikshit doesn't understand, Parikshit is not shy to say that he doesn't understand. For example, when uh, uh, Shukadev narrates the Rasa Leela in the 10th canto, which is in many ways the centerpiece of the whole Bhagavatam, the five chapters of the Rasa Leela, uh, Parikshit says, 
I don't understand. Krishna is supposed to be the very bridge of dharma. Krishna is supposed to be the person whose life is an example for all of us. But how am I to understand this? He's dancing with the wives of other men's other men in the middle of the forest. What kind of example is this setting for us? Now, of course, the commentators, they point out that uh, Parikshit, probably he knows the answer already to this. It's not like this is the first time he's heard about the Rasa dance. So sometimes he's asking questions, not only for his own benefit, Atmahitartham, but also for the benefit of others, Parahitartham. This is uh, one way of, of dividing questions. Some questions will be useful for us, some will be useful for others. And the best questions, of course, can be useful for both ourselves and others at the same time. So Parikshit, he asks plenty of questions throughout the Srimad Bhagavatam. There's one very nice little book on the Srimad Bhagavatam by uh, Sripad Bhakti Pradeep Tirtha Maharaj. Bhakti Pradeep Tirtha Maharaj was uh, a disciple of Bhakti Vinod Thakur, uh, who got sannyas from Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. He was Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's uh, first sannyas disciple. Uh, he passed away in the 50s, early 50s. He was one of the, the preachers that came to Europe in the 30s. And he's written a small book called, he wrote several books. And one of his books is called Bhagavata Samlapa, or Conversations of the Bhagavata, where he's collected verses of questions, and then he's collected the answers to those questions. If you can find that book, probably you can find it online as well, but I recommend it. It's it's a small, very handy and excellent book because it can give us an overview of many of the questions and answers of the Srimad Bhagavatam. In, very, in the very beginning of the Srimad Bhagavatam, even before this whole Parikshit story, which begins in the 13th chapter of the first canto, if I'm not mistaken. There are so many questions already before that by Shaunaka and the other rishis to Sutta Goswam. Nevertheless, in this Bhagavata Samlapa, uh, uh, Tirtha Maharaj, he brings out many of these questions of Parikshit Maharaj and the answers that Shukadev uh, provides. So Parikshit, he goes on listening to the Srimad Bhagavatam and he listens with such concentration and such relish that for seven days and nights, he doesn't sleep. He doesn't eat, he doesn't even drink. And remember, the whole curse started with him being too thirsty. But he forgets all about his thirst because he says, I'm drinking the nectar of Krishna Katha, like the Bhagavatam says in the third verse of the first chapter of the first canto, Pibata Bhagavatam Rasamalayam Muhuraho Rasika Bhuvibhavuka. Drink this nectar of the Bhagavata again and again, O Bhavukas, O connoisseurs of Bhava. So Parikshit is such a connoisseur. He is sustaining his life by listening to the Srimad Bhagavatam. When I was a kid, they used to say that a human being can survive for three days without water. That's an exaggeration. A human being can survive without water for, for longer than that, for, for a week or a little bit more even. But Parikshit, he doesn't drink, he doesn't eat for seven days. And he dies at the end of seven days, not from thirst. So he's such a powerful listener that he forgets about his bodily needs altogether. We may not be that good listeners ourselves, but I find this, this very inspiring, that he's able to listen in such a way. 
Uh, and I think one of the, the secrets for Parikshit's listening, of course, is the feeling that he has of necessity. He knows that he has only seven days. We don't usually think like that. We think that we have 20 years or 50 years or God. The dust of Vrindavan, Jagannath, and the Ganges. So he's sitting there by the Ganges. It's one of the most powerful things in this whole world. He's surrounded by the Rishis, and he's hearing the Srimad Bhagavatam from Shukadev. If Parikshit is the perfect listener, Shukadev is the perfect speaker. So he really has everything kind of going for him. And he takes full advantage of that. So Parikshit in this way is the paradigmatic example of listening. And uh, his life presents to me uh, an interesting example of a person who really does his best to kind of fight against the dark forces in the world. But when he realizes that the battle is lost, he immediately gives up. Uh, he immediately gives up. He realizes, I did my best. Again, it's time for me now to withdraw. I will sit down on the banks of the Ganges. I will let the curse uh, takes, take its course. As long as I can hear Krishna Katha, I don't mind. Let the snake bird come and bite me, he says. As long as I can hear Krishna Katha, there's nothing that I'm missing. So this is the story of Parikshit. Any questions or comments? Pranam? Um, <clears throat> I was just uh, just trying to think. He he forgot about drinking and eating, and I'm guessing also sleeping. Um, uh, and I, because, like like first, I was trying to think if one could like calculate which parts of the Bhagavatam were spoken at night and which were spoken in the day, just kind of for, for fun. But uh, uh, I wonder if, 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 one, if one would just read through the verses of the Bhagavatam, would it actually take seven days? Or is it more like a uh, st uh, like story that, it's, that it took seven days to speak it? That's a fun question. Uh, I can't say exactly how long it would take. But of course, there is something that is called Bhagavata Saptaha, uh, seven-day reading of the Bhagavatam, where, where people will come together under the, the leadership of some, some Vaishnava, who for seven days will give uh, talks on the Srimad Bhagavatam, not 24-7, but maybe six hours a day or something, uh, going through kind of central parts of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, I've been, I've never been to a whole Bhagavata Saptaha, but I've been to kind of parts of them, and and it's quite interesting to see how they do it. They they will they will read some parts, they will explain some other parts, they will sing some parts, and so on. But in the background, while this is going on, there will be a pundit who is reading the Srimad Bhagavatam, the verses, reading them aloud. Like this. Uh, and they will divide up the text. There's a system for it in uh, seven parts. All the 12 cantos divided up into seven parts. And then you read one of those seven parts a day. And uh, I don't know exactly how long it takes, but I do know it takes far less than 24 hours to read one of those seven parts. I, I can only guess how long, but I, I, I know that they don't need to sit there for 24 hours. So it takes less. And of course, uh, 
uh, what we have to realize is that our Srimad Bhagavatam, the Srimad Bhagavatam that we have, it's not exactly Shukas and Parikshit's Bhagavatam. Because, of course, sitting in, in that assembly of sages was Sutta Goswami. So Sutta heard the Srimad Bhagavatam from Parikshit. And he's uh, from, from Shukari, and he's retelling it to the sages of Naimi Sharanya. So he's expanding on some things, like in the first canto, he's telling the story of, of Parikshit. Obviously, Parikshit is not telling his own story. So he's adding some things. Maybe he's also leaving some other things out. So it's not exactly the same conversation as they had, but it's it's that conversation kind of retold by Sutta Goswami. And that conversation retold by Sutta Goswami is then retold by Prabhupada or whoever else translated the Srimad Bhagavatam that we are reading. So we're always getting this kind of uh, story within a story, within a story, within a story. And that's almost always a positive thing. Uh, one of the meanings of shuka, of course, is parrot. And there's this, uh, this uh, kind of, uh, you could say, like superstition that a fruit that has been bitten by a, or, or pecked by a parrot becomes more sweet. Uh, of course, it's one of the, these hen or egg things that usually parrots will go for the really sweet fruits. But nevertheless, if there's a fruit that has been pecked by a parrot, you will know that it's very, very sweet. So similarly, because the Srimad Bhagavatam was retold by Shukadeva, the parrot, it's extremely sweet. And then, of course, when it's retold again by Sutta, it's become even more sweet. And then when we hear it from Guru Maharaj or some other great saint, it becomes yet more sweet. So even if we don't have access to exactly the Bhagavatam of Shukadeva and Parikshit, we have access to something even more sweet. So we shouldn't feel we left out. Anything else? In that case, Dear devotees, thank you again for listening. Uh, I hope you will have a, a wonderful week ahead of you. And I hope to see you in further classes in the weeks to come. Jai Shishi Guru Gauranga Gandharika Giridari Shishi Radha Madan Mohan Radha Gauranga Radha Gopinatha Radha Madha Madha Radha Shama Sundara Radha Ramana Radha Ukul Mandara Radha Mahana Vada Vada Kupal Nithai Gaur Shri Shadavuj Giridari Ki Jai. Jai Vishnu Bhar Paranga Subhara Raja Kachari Ashto Uttara Shita Shishimad Bhakti Vedanta Tripura Aradi Voswa Maharaj Le Gurudev Ki Jai Jai Nitala Kavishnu Vishnu Bhar Abhai Chanana Aravinda Bhakti Vedanta Swam Maharaj Le Prabhupada Ki Jai Jai Nitala Kavishnu Vishnu Bhar Bhakti Raksha Kshedari Voswa Maharaj Ki Jai Jai Nitala Kavishnu Vishnu Bhar Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasati Voswa Maharaj Le Prabhupada Ki Jai Jai Gorki Shodas Prabhupada Maharaj Ki Jai Jai Shachi Dhananda Moita Kur Bhakti Vinod Ki Jai Jai Vaishnava Sarva Vashla Raghunatha Svabhaji Maharaj Ki Jai Jai Gauri Vedanta Chara Shlabhali Libhiti Bhushan Prabhu Ki Jai Jai Vishnu Chakra Arti Thakur Ki Jai Jai Shrinivasa Manananda Rottam Prabhu Trai Ki Jai Jai Krishna Das Kaviraj Goswam Raj Ki Jai Jai Vyasa Vata Shri Vrindavan Das Thakur Mahashai Ki Jai Jai Shirupa Sanatana Bhattar Gunata Ji Ji Vopala Bhattar Asogana Shogoshun Rubu Ki Jai Jai Namachari Shila Haradasta Kur Ki Jai Jai Primsa Gosh Krishna Chaitanya Pramanichananda Shidvaita Gradar Shivasar Shigaur Bhaktar Inda Ki Jai Jai Shri Navadweep Dham Ki Jai Shri Brindavan Dham Ki Jai Shri Jagannath Pura Dham Ki Jai Jai Char Vaishnava Sampradai Ki Jai Char Vaishnava Chari Ki Jai Char Dham Ki Jai Char Veda Ki Jai Grantara Shimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Jai Parikshit Maharaj ki jai. Shri Shukadev Goswami ki jai. Jai Bhuvan Mangal Harinam Sankirtan ki jai. 
గౌర భక్తరిండకి జై సమాగత గౌర భక్తరిండకి జై గౌర్ ప్రేమనందే హరి హరి బో శ్రీమన్ బ్రిగుపాట్ ప్రభుకి జై గౌర భక్తరిండకి జై హరి